Should we Alec let's, and have the ring? Let's hide biscuits at various places <laughs> around the bike. We'll do a biscuit hunt. <laughs> hey, this will be me in a, c a couple of years, just to get that. Yeah. This is a fully set up bike, right? Yeah. Just how... I thought this would be like iron, but it's like the most progressive, soft, beautiful... Yeah. Is that how he runs it? Yeah. That's actually how yeah. he runs it. What has changed this year? The delicacy, because... Uh, I don't know. Uh, what's amazing. also changed this year, though, the depth of angle he has on the front brake lever is completely different this year. There's been some things changed this year have been strange, but the level's constantly moving it's on. It's gone up, so, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, well, we should say hello, really, shouldn't we? Hello. Say hello. Because we're just gassing. Hello. Uh, PD, Paul Denning. From, uh, That's me. I'm Paul Denning. Uh, Patter Snacks. Yes. And um, we're down at Crescent. You're not for Patter Snacks, obviously. You're the... Uh, what's your t team... Boss, what's your what's your principal? Team principal is a good word, yeah. Team principal it reminds me of a school sort of thing. I like okay. that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, team principal of the. And it is like uh, looking after children. I can imagine. So yeah, there's quite a lot of children. Yeah. Yeah. And is it technically the Bricks.com? Pata Yamaha Pata with Yamaha. Bricks. Okay, Pata Yamaha World with Bricks. Bricks. Okay. Now we've got the legal pleasantries out the way. Yeah. Look at this. This is Top Bricks bike. Yeah. This is amazing. So the 2022 R1. Um, obviously the base machine is based on the evolved R1 from 2020 when mm -hmm. it came out with the new aerodynamic package and the new cylinder head um, and uh, that bike it, as we see in the Crescent showroom and on the demonstrators we're running here today uh, is an awesome package but to take it to the level to be uh, not only competitive enough to win the World Superbike Championship, which we were fortunate enough to do last year. Well done, by the way. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank Amazing. You very much. And obviously having won the manufacturer's title, the team's title, and uh, Locatelli being Rookie of the Year, it was just a season that all those kind of dreams that you've yeah. always dreamt of came together. Well, it was a good um, for Yamaha all round, wasn't it? BSB, MotoGP, yeah. so Absolutely. you're in the right camp. Very much so. And. Uh, but retention of anything once you've won it is a cliche, but they say it's more difficult. And uh, so far this year, that's proven the case. But the, um, by any measure, we're a lot better than we were last year. We're going fast qualifying. We're in a different league than we were last year. Uh, and in the races, we're an average of half a second a lap faster. The rhythm in uh, the Super Bowl race that Top Rack won on this bike in Mizano last weekend, um, 33s nearly every lap is a quality lap. Um, and even though he finished second in the race two, the long race, uh, his own race was eight seconds faster than when he won it last year. Wow. So things keep moving on and the bike's got to move on with it and um, it's a constant challenge. And I guess he's got a, I mean, we just did an interview with him uh, around the corner. So and I guess he's got to ride harder as well. So it's not yeah. just the bike that's got better, he's got a ride, like the competition, I mean, from a spectator's point of view, World Superbikes is, it's, it's the one, if I could choose, you can only watch one each weekend, mm. definitely World Superbikes. Sure. To have those top three manufacturers all up there, completely different bikes, different riders, different yeah. styles, it's, it's a spectacle to watch. And, 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 that, and that's changed a lot in the last couple of years, and obviously, yeah. uh, Jonathan's a six-time world champion, he's just uh, an animal, and, um, you know, to win that consistently is something very special, but it kind of, in the end, turns people away very slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not only, so I don't think it's only the fact there's been fresh competition, uh, obviously the fight between Jonathan and Top Rack last year, um, but also just the nature of the racing, and Jonathan's had to raise his own game. He'd freely admit last year he got beat, but he probably rode better than he ever did when he won those titles. So um, uh, the nature of the racing, the sort of, brutality of it almost and gladiatorial sort of nature yeah. of, that, of that racing I think is for sure what we're seeing in the numbers at the tracks on social media watching on it's TV amazing. is uh, exponentially growing again um, and it's because the guys can get away with a lot with the production based superbike yeah. that the Grand Prix riders are struggling with a little bit so uh, the fights are huge yeah. so so what's the, the what's the new weaponry then that we've got on this 2022 bike that you can take us through and go without obviously giving away too many secrets, but sure. any, you know, nice improvements or little nice factory details that you want to talk us through on this bike? So the bike is uh, based on the stock R1, um, but being a factory developed bike, uh, developed actually in Italy more than in Japan, 
uh, by YMRE, the research group, which sits in a semi-detached building basically with the Grand Prix project. So there's a lot of uh, technical know-how in Italy uh, and our chief designer Riccardo Tischi um, is uh, just into every single detail in terms of uh, trying to take this bike continue to a, a different level. Um, the mainframe itself, uh, particularly for top rack, needs to be quite a lot stronger in the braking support uh, than the production frame. So it's not a secret, you can see a lot of stiffening uh, mm -hmm. around the headstock and around the top of the frame. Um, but as always with wow. motorcycles, as a and, and that's to stop flex effectively to make to to to, to stop it ever so slightly. Well, top rank was riding a little bit too aggressively in FP1, FP2, Mizano. He hadn't won yet, and I think he was really wanted to go out and sort of smash the track record on the first lap. And um, it was a little bit too aggressive on his sort of first phase of braking, and he was going from literally not feathering the brake in, but from nothing mm. to 20 bar in one hit. So you're talking about nearly 400 of PSI through that brake lever, and um, that's gonna twist the uh, forks out of the yokes and basically bend the frame. Um, right, the, okay. The, you know, it's just in, So it's not necessarily a feeling thing, it's actually more about a structural... No, it's, it's, it's feeling, but basically not giving the, the right, it's difficult to do, it's difficult for you and you know, you ride your bike well on track. I like to have oh, a thank little, thank you, Paul. I, you know, <laughs> I, I like to have a little skid, skid round. Yeah. We, we ride bikes mm. compared to these guys, we don't no. have a clue <laughs> the forces that are putting through the suspension, uh, through the braking system, and therefore transferring it through the chassis. It's just, just a completely different sport, a completely mm. different thing that they're doing. Um, and they can feel things that you and I would never even uh, consider as, so they can feel movement in the bike and recovery in the bike, which is structural, not in the suspension. Um, so getting the stiffness balance in the frame right between uh, braking stiffness and side angle grip is a, is a constant battle that uh, uh, we've had to evolve. All of that said about Top Rack's very um, special braking style, whatever's been evolved for Top Rack has also worked for Locatelli, for Garrett, um, and for any other Yamaha riders, so, um, and even the BSB riders, because they run a bike that's basically one year back from the Factory World Superbike, so Jason and Taz are basically running the uh, latest stuff. So um, okay. th that evolution has been useful for all Yamaha riders, yeah. Um, what's this little uh, choke? So last, last year, actually, that lever was a PW50 choke lever. This, right. year, this year, Ricardo's designed something much nicer in aluminium, but the first time Top Rack saw it, he said, hmm, this is bathroom tap, hot, cold. <laughs> but no, the, um, this lever basically allows the rider to engage neutral. The gearbox is stand in its layout, but the way the shift drum works is that neutral's now at the top, not between first and second. Right. So, with this lever closed for the race, it means it's impossible for the rider to get neutral. Okay, so so no false neutrals, basically. Exactly, and obviously, okay. as you know, the gap between second and first is the longest upshift gap or backshift gap. Um, and if you just half click the lever, it's possible to get a neutral there. Um, mistakes, whether they're rider induced or stress induced or fatigue induced, are. Um, part of racing and mm -hmm. uh, the more we can do with the bike to negate that, uh, the better. So um, that's the development which uh, they use in BSB as well, quite uh, successfully as well. Okay. This is quite an interesting thing I've just spotted. This, it's like, a, is this rider preference? Like, it's almost like no, on a just, cam to sort of come yeah, out of it. But it's cross-threaded. Yeah. It's like yeah, I put it's it on. Just, <laughs> <laughs> simply, to angle, simply to angle it back so that we have physically got the protection right. uh, over the end of the lever because um, it's so tight going into turn one um, and yeah. uh, that, that's an FIM requirement and uh, it's uh, a really good requirement. That was introduced after that massive accident in MotoGP between Gibernau, Caparossi and the yeah. guys on the entry to turn one at Catalonia. So, um, and it's been there ever since, which is a, a good idea. Um, going through the bike, if you look a little bit front to back, um, what can I tell you? Ooh, so this looks nice. Yeah, that's the very latest um, 2022 caliper uh, with a 328 mil disc. So the disc is as basically as big as you can get, whilst allowing the caliper not to be wow. rubbing on the rim. And this is like a heat dissipation as also well. Also, additional wow. cooling. Yeah. 
Um, Never seen that. This particular bike, which I think must have been a spare bike from the weekend, not the race bike, um, hasn't got the A carbon fiber duct. So yeah. we've got cooling via the caliper, via the disc, and normally a big carbon duct. Um, depending, we don't use the carbon duct unless we have to, but with top rack, most of the time we have to. The reason we don't want to is just extra aerodynamic drag. Um, you know, too big. So, so it does. So it does increase drag. Yes, absolutely, because yeah. it's two big slots channeling yeah, air. Yeah. So those effectively hanging off the bottom of the fork are increasing drag. But Is that, with, would, the, would that have contributed to the uh, incident last year with the this whole aero area? No, not really. Um, you just forgot to do you're the talking about the portamao. Yeah. No, we actually had a failure uh, of the simply enough the bracket that holds the right, wow, front okay. guard on. It's a part that um, been on the bike since 2018, I believe. Uh, not on the bike since 18, but that yeah. design since 18. And um, we believe that hindsight being a powerful thing, that in race one, when Toprak and Jonathan hit each other really hard in that tight left before you make the long right in yeah, Portimao, yeah. Um, that basically put a fatigue crack. And then Yamaha in Italy, through the R&D department, did a full FEM analysis on the part. And even though you couldn't see an external crack, there was internal crack. So it looked like the part had had a whack, mm. moved enough to put an internal crack, and then the stresses of uh, the next race. It's, it's amazing. It it, like, even resonance and stuff. We were on a, it was, what was that, 125? Um, yeah, Freetech. Freetech. Yeah. So just, we were running a separate, a different pad and a disc, and just the way that the resonance caused it to make a noise would fracture certain parts, and you're just like, you know, the, the level of detail that must mm. go into all of this development is quite, is, it's amazing more stuff doesn't yeah. go wrong. I'm, so, yeah, you know. so it's obviously everything is optimized for weight, but that's now got the beefiest front mud guard bracket on it, you'll ever see. <laughs> that's, that's never going to happen again. Yeah. Um, Akropovich worked closely with us. Obviously, people just think that, you know, exhaust systems are um, what they are, but the development that goes there, we've now got um, the manifolds as they go into the cylinder head. Uh, are now produced via a technique called investment casting in titanium. Akropovich okay. are only one of uh, three. Yes, okay. uh, like a three 3D also. printing type job, is it? No, and I'm not even going to pretend what I know what investment okay. casting is. What I did learn when I was at Akropovich, they're one of very, very few people in the world who can do it, and it's used a lot for medical, uh, medical instruments. Um, but what it allows, because the part is uh, cast in titanium, it allows the port shape to be an exact match to the exhaust port on the cylinder head. Um, so that's been a, a small step this year. Um, and uh, we're constantly looking for small upgrades in horsepower because, as you mentioned earlier, particularly this year, we knew it was going to be a challenge racing against Bautista on the Ducati. Yeah. Um, we could pretty much live with Scott Redding in that he's, I'm guessing, guy, yeah. late 70s kilo. Top rack's 69, 70 kilos. Bautista's about 53. So if you've got a... And, and, and he's tiny. Aerodynamically, he's therefore very good. But acceleration and stopping the bike, he's very, very good because there's just nothing to stop. But he's using the tool he has. You know, I don't think we've been beaten in a race by any Ducati in this year apart from Alvaro. So he's using the tool he has very, very well indeed. Yeah. Um, what else can I tell you about Top Rack's bike? Let's uh, maybe have a look in the cockpit. It's sort of like a dual, is this a thumb brake issue? Is this yeah. a dual setup for so, a rear and Yeah, bar? so Top Rack uses a traditional thumb brake. He's, he's, I'd say, in the minority now, in that most of the riders are using what we call the index brake, the mountain bike brake. Yeah. Therefore, someone like Locatelli's clutch lever will be up there. Yeah. His rear brake will be here. But Top Rack, for hand control of the rear brake, has just got used to that, and he doesn't. He, that's what he knows. He uses it a lot on corner entry. Um, it's a fine balance with the rear brake on corner entry because it can produce chatter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, through the front I mean, it's, the when he's riding, it's mainly up in the air anyway, isn't it? So Yeah, I, I do question why he quite has to use the rear brake, because I don't know quite what it does, but it's that final part of just sucking the bike into the corner. And can you see that on the telemetry, obviously? Like everything, when he's is using measured, it. Yeah. Yeah. everything is measured, yeah. Everything is measured, absolutely everything, yeah. And we've got, this is quite interesting, we've got two shift rods here, so... We haven't, in fact, this is the shift rod and with the um, pressure sensor, which obviously does the uh, quick shift for upshifting and backshifting. That's a movement sensor, so okay, that's so a that's linear, just... linear potentiometer that shows us both speed and uh, movement of shift. It's quite important because the shifting, the backshift is uh, 
critical to get right and um, you need to just make sure that the lever is getting, you know, it's just a traditional yeah. gearbox, the lever has to be back in its original position before it will take the yeah. next shift. I mean, this all looks actually really nice, solid. You look at a lot of racing rear sets and they're flimsy, horrible, yeah. wobbly things. This looks absolutely proper. Well, again, I think if it was a flimsy, horrible thing, Top could snap it off within half a lap. <laughs> he, he ruins the bike compared to any rider we've ever had. He absolutely ruins really? the bike. Really? He gives it some, does he? Oh, honestly, the rear suspension linkage, swing arm bearings, headstock bearings, um, the chassis itself, it just, uh, it, it wears stuff out to an extent that um, we've never seen with another rider, yeah, um, just the amount of, but the force, look at entry to turn eight in Mazzano last week, I don't know what the speed is, probably 200 kilometers an hour and the rear wheel's completely in the air and then it's That's the sharp left. And the, it's the quercia corner at yeah, the end. Yeah, amazing. And, um, so yeah, so he's put an awful lot through the bike. Um, something that we, you can clearly see, so it's not a secret, um, is how long the swing arm is. Mm. Um, and that's been an, as tire development has gone forward and we're using more and more of these very soft compound uh, tires that Pirelli have developed in the last couple of years, um, we're now using those even for the long races, the sort of 35 minute races. Um, and to have the right tire consumption and handling balance, not only our bike, but if you look across the grid, the Kawasaki swing arm's got longer, the Ducati one certainly, um, and we're sort of kind of in Santa Pods sort of setting now on the swing arm, <laughs> but, it, but it, the bike works, it's uh, loading the front more because of the long swing arm and uh, the, the turning is very, very good. Um, and do you think, because I mean, I'm, I, I know nothing really about setting up bikes, but generally the longer the swing arm, the more stable the bike a, appears to be. So why, why aren't road swing arms like that? Do, do we think, like, do, does any development go, I mean, I know a lot of race development goes back into the road for, mm. for Yamaha, but you never see these great I think, things. No, but the reason is that, again, you and I, a nimble bike, bike will generally be a short bike yeah. that feels easy to turn because we're just not putting the forces through the bike that these guys are. And we're also not demanding as much power on corner exit because obviously the shorter you have the bike, the more it's going to tend to wheelie. Yeah. And therefore the more you have to reduce the power. And on corner entry, top rack in particular, wants the rear end to break a little bit as he enters the last part of the corner. His technique of sliding the rear in order to get part of the corner done before the apex um, means that the rear has to be predictable. It's one of our big challenges is balancing the grip because honestly if we have too much rear grip he hates the feeling pushing of the, the rear front. pushing the front exactly so that that balancing that grip and having a package that has good drive grip but allows him to break the traction on corner entries uh, uh, with rear suspension damping spring rates rear linkage ratio um, front wheel position because we can adjust, we can adjust the headstock for, if you actually look from the side, you'll see how far back the, yeah. uh, the head pipe is in the chassis compared to the uh, uh, options that are there. So not only position of the head pipe, but also angle is fully adjustable. So there are other ways which we can afford to have a longer swing arm and still have very good steering uh, and very nimbler. Have you ridden this bike? No, I'd love to actually. Um, Why not? I did three days on our sort of yeah, yeah, it's no, your but, bike, um, come on. It's not actually my bike, these are Yamahas actually. Oh. Yeah, the way, that, the way that it works, these are Yamahas. But, um, something new for this year is the subframe, um, which is... This looks further back as well for the... It's, it's lower, that's basically the difference. The, the, the subframe is full carbon fibre and Ricardo has played with the riding position this year so that, you know, the distance there to there is standard, but the uh, subframe is tilted and down so that the rider is flatter and lower in the bike and again because they're just looking for so much deceleration if the you know in what feels comfortable to us top brake just would, would feel like he's too far over that he needs to be in the bike so he can stop it uh, as, as much as he wants to and that is the thinnest seat yeah yeah I think that's a feel thing with him he hates uh, that cushiness he wants to absolutely feel the tire as directly as he possibly can so he, in fact, has had to have this carbon subframe made a little bit more stiff than the other riders because he doesn't like any flex, any, uh, any, any movement in, the, in that area of the bike. And compared to the stock bike as well, a lot of the fuel is under here as well. So the fuel tank that you see 
is not really all fuel tank. Most a, a good chunk of the fuel is under the seat here as well. So here's a um, question you're probably not going to answer. How much does it cost? Um, I think the. What's it worth? What's it worth, me? I don't know. What, well, what Top Rack's World Championship winning bike is worth is probably. A, a lot more than the assembly of the parts actually. This is I, true. I think a complete assembly of parts, so ignoring R and D costs, design costs and the overheads to do so, but if you just buy the parts from Yamaha, uh, I think the total cost of the machine is about 150,000. That's actually not that bad, but that's without it being built. So if I yeah. said to you, I've just won the lottery and I want you me to I want you to build me this bike. That's what you're looking at. Or like plus another 50 grand for No, I mean, you'd have to, obviously you'd have to pay somebody who knows what they're doing to put it together. Yeah, well, um, you. But not me, no. Um, but um, I, I'm, we, we have very good people on the team. That's part of uh, being a team principal is knowing what you're good at and what you're not. Um, and definitely me screwing it together is not something you'd want to ride. But um, the uh, problem wouldn't be so much the parts cost. It would be whether Yamaha have the capacity to yeah. build another one. Because, of course, we have... Four bikes almost identical for Top Rack, Locatelli, Gerloff and Mazzane. Uh, Christian Ponson's privateer bike is almost identical. Because um, you don't have spare bikes either, do you? You're not allowed. We do. Oh, you, you are allowed. But they're not allowed in the garage, so they're at the back. So okay. we, we have uh, two bikes per rider and enough bikes, enough parts to build at least another three. Right. It's quite a small little fuel nozzle. Have you got a special wanger that goes in there? A special what? Like a, yeah. like a little wanger. wanger. Yeah, like a, a special little, fuel wanger. Yeah, a fuel dumper. Are you really interested in your wanging dumper? Yeah, it's just, you know, it's quite a... Yeah, yeah I don't think that's very interesting. No, it's just a no, hole. No, it's just a hole, isn't it? Yeah, Any holes in there. Gold. Yeah, 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 that's the throttle. That's the throttle, yeah, right, that's yeah. The that's how it works. And, and fork yeah. extensions, so, we, so... That's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. That is a good question. So, um, that is as far down in the front as Top Rack will ever have his bike. And it's the trend now, isn't it? It's all of the bikes are sort of low rock, low, low Harley-ish. And for, it, I don't think I'm breaking any confidentialities and um, if any of the other teams are listening, but um, when we run the qualifying tire and we have a big dollop extra rear grip, Top Rack always wants the front end up further. We'll put the front end up as much as five to 10 mil uh, on the ride height because again, for corner entry with the rear extra grip, he doesn't want the <coughs> rear pushing the front. Um, and, when you, and when you raise the front that much, do you then have to go, right, we've, hang on hang on a minute, Bob, we've raised the front, so now we've got to do something back here. No, is no, it just, just simple, just Bob, Bob? Raise the front and, wow. and maybe an adjustment to the preload on the spring to compensate, but, but that's all, yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, and qualifying was, was one of his weak points on the Kawasaki, and it was a weak point in 2020. Um, but he's really, really worked on that and particularly taking uh, the weight off the front tyre when we've got the additional rear grip has made a big difference. Mm. Um, That's why I crashed at Portsmouth. Yeah. Too much grip on the rear of that BMW. Mm. You really think that was the reason? I, I'm just shit as well, yeah. There's that as well, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, they're, uh, they're a thing of beauty. I mean, the attention to detail now. And, but the great thing with World Superbike is you and I can still relate to it as an R1. Yeah, you know, and that's still, why I love it. You know, and it's, it's the classic win on a Sunday, yeah. on a Monday. You yeah, know? absolutely. Um, do, do you think sometimes, because there's a lot of, uh, it's Dawner now that runs World Super Bikes, yeah. isn't it? So there's a lot of um, meddling, some people will call it, in terms of, right, well, that bike's too fast, that's a bit of green paint, that's this, that's that. But the level that it's all got to now is so high yeah. that you've almost need that. I think that overall they're doing a pretty good job. I, I think they've done a brilliant job. I think the, the regulations are there to be followed, mm. but I think the main purpose of the regulation is, is to balance performance between the bikes. Yeah. And so do you think the Ducati is going to get some revs knocked off in the next couple of rounds? Uh, well, it's round six, isn't it, it happens? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. it's only know. Bautista that's... Yeah, I mean, what can I say? Last year in Mazzano, Ronaldi beat Top Rack in the first two races mm. and won them. Uh, and Top Rack beat him in the last race. I mean, Ronaldi didn't get close to Top no. Rack all weekend, but Bautista's exactly. taken a step on the bike. So um, uh, it's a difficult one when it, it is rider specific. I think a wider question that is a lot more relevant is that the 600 Supersport class this year has got a total bike and rider weight minimum. Yeah. And I think that's been under discussion 
for some time within the manufacturers group and within the FIM for Superbike. Um, and the problem is if you get a 53 kilo, very short rider doing a brilliant job on the most powerful bike, on a bike that costs around 40 grand, whereas these cost 15, that total balance starts to move yeah. away a little bit into the wrong area. So I and think- And being a big lad, big lad myself, it's, you just never, I mean, I'm never, I was never gonna win anything anyway, but it's, you're gonna struggle, aren't you? It's just, a, yeah, like I mean, Scott on the Ducati last year, it's, it's, he's being penalized for being too I mean, big. It's not only a question of outright performance, of course, the tire wear is a lot less. Um, Alvaro needs less lean angle to turn the bike. He can be slower in the middle of the corner, pick it up and, no, and not lose anything. So top brake's actually getting off the corners better with the throttle open earlier. Um, but as soon as Alvaro's upright, the combination of size, weight and mm. power uh, is creating a problem. So I think for sure 24, but I hope for next year that there'll be this uh, minimum weight balance between the ride around the bike because that will help us a lot. Yeah, that, yeah. That will I'd help. welcome that. I think it's a leveling, it's a leveling thing, isn't it? Yeah, because you can't, it's just uh, if you're two equally good riders and one's 20 kilos less, it's very difficult. Yeah. 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 That was fun. Paul, thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks for coming uh, down. Can we ride one of these one day? No, never. Even a, um, like a test bike? I'll tell you what, that would be a nice thing to do. Yeah, and it I would. Will, I, would <laughs> yeah. I would encourage Yamaha to, because back in the MotoGP well, days, we used to do the journalist tests, you know, yeah. at Valencia and the, after and the, the final race. And the well, Superbikes. That's right, yeah, yeah, really back in the day. And I think it's uh, particularly with Superbike, where you can relate it to the stock machine. Yeah. I think it's a nice idea. I think it's something we should look at again. Let's do it. it might mean I get a go as well. Yeah, well, you, yeah. it's yours. Well, it's sort not, not, but I wish it was. Yeah.